Well, brothers and sisters, after the exertions of this afternoon, the soccer and the cricket and the walking and whatever else you might have been involved in, and uh, a good meal, we're going to talk about rest. So I hope that's not too significant and that you're not going to do that just yet. We uh, completed our studies this morning by looking at the uh, way in which the Lord Jesus Christ had to be one of us, like his brethren, in order to deliver us. And uh, chapter 3 of Hebrews begins again with a very clear linking word to what's already been said. Wherefore, or therefore, because of what's gone before, because of the responsibility that we have from chapter 2 and verse 1, we have to take heed lest there be in any of us that uh, wrong attitude that Israel manifest, and also because of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ as the captain of our salvation and as the high priest who succors us. Wherefore, let us consider Jesus Christ. Uh, When we get to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, um, a little later, God willing, perhaps, Um, tomorrow evening or Saturday morning, the Apostle will tell us to consider one another. Let us consider one another, that we should provoke one another unto love and to good works. But first of all, we have to consider our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our example. We can't consider how we might help and support one another until we have first set the right example before our eyes. So we're to consider him to begin with. And what the the writer here says is, let us consider the apostle and high priest of our calling. In fact, he's going to talk about two apostles and two high priests. He's going to talk about Israel's high priest Aaron and our Lord Jesus Christ in relation to him, having superseded him, as it were. And he's going to talk about two apostles. One again is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the other is Moses. And he's going to relate those two to each other in the first few verses of chapter 3. An apostle, you know, is someone who is sent. That's what the word means. Someone who is sent. In this case, the twelve apostles were sent by Jesus Christ. Jesus was sent by God. And Moses was an apostle because he was similarly sent by God. Don't turn it up, but Exodus chapter 3 and verse 10 contains the words of God to Moses at the bush. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God sent Moses. He was an apostle. And we're comparing now the apostleship of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom God has sent to deliver us from our Egypt, from the background of the sin and death to which we are in bondage. Let's have a look at at Hebrews chapter 3 then, and going at verse 2. Talking about Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Now, the pronouns there are very important. All his house is not Moses' house, but God's house. So, Jesus was faithful to his Father, to God who sent him for the work that he had to do, the work of deliverance. And in the same way, Moses was also faithful as a servant in all God's house. So once again, we're drawing that contrast that we saw in chapter 1 between Jesus and the angels, now between Jesus and Moses. Jesus, you remember, is the heir. He is the son of God. He is faithful as a son over God's house, the house that he's going to inherit. It's his own house, isn't it? Because he is the son of God. Whatever is God's is his. Because he is the Son. 
So Jesus is the heir. It's his house. God's house belongs to him. Whereas Moses was merely a servant in God's house. And so Moses, who was so respected, so venerated by the Jews, is here put into his proper place, isn't he? Once again, he is subservient, subservient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as we saw Jesus and the angels compared before, and saw how superior Jesus was to them, so here Jesus is so much superior to Moses. Important though Moses was, and vitally important, especially in the minds of the Jews. That's a theme that comes in various places in the New Testament. You may remember how in Acts chapter 15, it's one of the issues. And in Galatians, the Apostle Paul says how there was an occasion when he had to withstand Peter to the face, because in effect, by their conduct, Peter and those with him were making Moses the yardstick. They were making Moses more important than Jesus. They were measuring things by Moses and what Moses had said. And that would never do. Paul would not allow for one moment the fact that Moses might be exalted above Jesus. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who is the heir of all that is God's. So that's what the Apostle is saying here in these verses. Moses was faithful in all God's house. Verse 5, you can see, he says, as a servant. But in verse 6, Jesus Christ is the heir. And we, brothers and sisters, are part of Christ's house, aren't we? Baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, we are part of him, of his family. We belong to him. So the house is ours in Christ. And verses 3 and 4, Moses was also part of that same house. So there, in those first six verses, you can see how the Apostle summarizes exactly what we've said, comparing Moses and Jesus. And then in verse 7, <clears throat> he turns to a quotation from the Old Testament. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Those verses 7 to 11 are a quotation from Psalm 95, starting at verse 7 in the psalm. It's quite a long quotation, isn't it, really? Why does the apostle here choose to quote from Psalm 95 at such length? What is the relevance of that psalm? Well, It's actually very relevant. Let's just look at these verses for a moment. The Holy Spirit saith. So this is a message from God. It's an inspired message from Psalm 95. Today, if you will hear his voice. And the problem was that Israel hadn't heard. There in the wilderness, under Moses, they had hardened their heart. They were not prepared to accept the word of God. In particular, God had promised them the land. That's why it's called the promised land. And they doubted his promise. And Psalm 95 is is just alluding to some of the occasions in the wilderness when Israel tested God. Now, the wilderness experience primarily was for God to test Israel. That's what it was all about. Deuteronomy 8 tells you that, that God suffered them to hunger and then fed them with manna. He led them for 40 years through the wilderness to prove them, to humble them, to see what was in their heart, whether they would turn to him in their need and and pray to him for help, whether they would look to him and depend upon him or not. And most often they did not. But Israel in their wickedness turned the tables on God. 
God is entirely entitled to test us, isn't he? He is our creator. It's like an engineer who makes a bridge and, and tests its strength. He puts loads on it to see what weight it will bear. And the Lord God has that right to test us, to see what we're capable of, what we're made of. He never tests us to breaking point, as an engineer might do with a bridge, but he does test us, tries our faith. That is his right as our creator. We are not entitled to test God. When Israel turned the tables and, uh, and tried to see whether God was as good as his word, that was a wicked thing to do because we, we should know that God is always as good as his word. We must always take God at his word. That's what he asks of us, that faith to trust him, to accept at face value whatever he says and to put our confidence in it. That's what Israel did not do in the wilderness. And so, in particular, they tempted him and proved him, and Psalm 95 speaks especially about the occasion when they wanted water from the rock, and they tested God at Massah and at Meribah. They tested him, they proved him, and they saw his works for 40 years. It's an interesting phrase, that. It doesn't say they tempted him and proved him even though they saw his works. I don't think it's talking about the miracles that they witnessed, wonderful though they were, convincing though they ought to have been. I think it's saying that they tempted him and proved him and saw his works as a result. They saw his works of judgment poured out upon them because of their wickedness. It's not the miracles, is it? Because it doesn't say even though they saw his works or but they saw his works. And they saw his works as a result of their wicked testing and proving of God, they saw his works of judgment. And here in Hebrews, that's particularly relevant because the writer is urging these these Jewish Christians not to be the same. Not to test God by giving in and going back to the law. Not to, to test God by giving up on Jesus Christ and under pressure going back to the things of Moses, the weaker things. And you see, Psalm 95 is especially pertinent because it mentions the 40 years. Israel were 40 years in the wilderness because of their wickedness, because of their lack of faith in Numbers 13 and 14 when they'd sent out the spies and the spies brought back a an evil report, the majority of them. Fascinating, isn't it, that they all saw the same things. Joshua and and Caleb, they saw the same giants, just as tall, and and the cities with big high walls and and defences and bars. But they, they saw them with God in mind. They were men of faith, and when they looked at those things, they looked at them with the eye of faith. But the ten men who were not faithful brought back an evil report. They said, oh, we couldn't hope to fight it. Well, they weren't supposed to fight against them in their own strength, were they? God had said he would overcome the giants. He'd destroy the cities. He had promised them the land. And he would make make plain the way into it. They did not accept his word. It wasn't that they intended to be unfaithful. They didn't sit down and discuss it and say, now, what should we do to bring back an evil report? It's just the way they saw things. They were unfaithful men. That's just the way they looked at things. And so when they brought back, ten of them, this majority report that they could never ever get into the land, and Israel accepted that, God was displeased. And they wandered for a further 38 years, 40 years in total, in the wilderness. Well, there were approximately 40 years between our Lord Jesus Christ's ministry and the destruction of A.D. 70. And this writer, inspired by God, I think is using Psalm 95 because he's picking up on the significance of that. Here are 40 years, a 40-year period again. Don't tempt God in that 40 years, he says, or you'll be caught up in the destruction, the judgments of God that were poured out upon the generation in the wilderness and will be poured out on Jerusalem in AD 70 when God sent the Romans to destroy Jerusalem and its temple. 
So Psalm 95 is particularly significant in that way because it mentions that similar period of 40 years. So verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 3 Beware the pressure to go back is what the the apostle here is saying. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Be warned by that generation of Israel in the wilderness. Learn the lesson. Make sure you're not going back as they try to go back to Egypt. As they looked behind them and longed for the things that they left behind. Don't do the same, this writer is saying. Don't go back to the Lord. Don't give up on Jesus Christ. Take heed, lest that same heart of tempting and testing God that was in Israel finds expression in your life as well. Now we shall see a little later (coughs) that there are some chapters here in Hebrews which we have to put in brackets. There's a, a big bracket going to go at the beginning of chapter 5. We'll, we'll come to that a little later. And it goes right up to the end of verse 18 in chapter 10. All that's in brackets. We'll, we'll talk about that a little later. You don't need to worry about that just now. But the result of that is that here, in chapters 3 and 4, you meet some um, words and some phrases that are picked up again in chapter 10 after verse 18, when the argument is picked up. And I just want to point one of those out to you now. Um, There are these parallel phrases in chapters 3 and 4 with chapter 10, where the argument continues. So, just let me read again verse 12 of chapter 3. (coughs) Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Evil heart, unbelief, departing from the living God. And incidentally, whenever we come across the word belief or believing, it's almost always exactly the same word as when we read faith or being faithful. So, the words belief and faith in this letter are largely interchangeable. Now, here's a verse from chapter 10. It's chapter 10 and verse 22. You needn't turn it up. I'll I'll, uh, I'll read it to you. But just look again at verse 12 as we read this. Chapter 3, verse 12. This is chapter 10, verse 22, where the apostle is picking up the same argument and moving on after that large section in brackets. And he says, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having, your heart, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So can you see the, the phrases there that the Apostle is picking up in chapter 10? Here we've got departing from God and in chapter 10 we've got draw near. Here we've got an evil heart and in chapter 10 we've got a true heart. Here we've got unbelief. In chapter 10 we've got the full assurance of faith. So, can you see what the, what the writer here is doing? Here in chapter 3 he's saying, Look, don't be like Israel, departing from God, an evil heart, full of unbelief. And then there's this large section in brackets when he's going to talk about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as our high priest. And then in chapter 10 he says, So, in view of all that, Far from departing from God, draw near. Far from an evil heart, show that you've got a true heart. Put aside any unbelief, make sure that you have the full assurance of faith in what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished. So I hope you can can see there um, part of the, the argument as it will continue much later in our studies, God willing. We now come to verse 13 where the Apostle comments uh, on this Psalm 95 when he says, But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That word today 
came in that quotation from Psalm 95, didn't it? There in verse 7. And now he's picking up on that idea of today. That word today is a sort of <clears throat> two-edged sword, really, isn't it? On the one hand, we should be very thankful that it's today. It means that there is still an opportunity. God has not yet closed the door. It's still today. There's still time to do something about the problems that we have. On the other hand, today also implies that it's not going to last very long, doesn't it? That the opportunity is short. At the moment it's today, but there's an implied warning, isn't there, that soon today will be over. Soon it will be tomorrow. Soon it will be too late. So there is both an opportunity and a warning expressed in that one little word, today. And that's in the, in the writer's mind here. He, he's thinking a, a about that idea of today as both uh, an opportunity and a warning. And then in verse 14, he's urging them to hold on to Christ. For we are made partakers of Christ. That's what we said, wasn't it? That in Christ, we are part of his house. Part of all that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to inherit as the Son of God. We are partakers of him. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And that's what we read in verse 6, wasn't it? If you go back to, to verse 6, that's exactly what was going on then. This holding fast uh, of confidence. Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence? So he's repeating that very same idea. The need to hold on, to, to hang on tight to our confidence, our trust, our faith in God. We're to make sure that we don't let it slip. And the relevance of Psalm 95 again is being expressed here, isn't it? He means not going back, holding on to our confidence, holding fast to our belief rather than going back to Egypt. That's what Israel should have done, wasn't it? Held on to the promises that God had made. Held on to the confidence with which they left Egypt when they put their trust in what God had said before they let it slip. And then in verses 16 to 19, we've got a further reference to the, the work of the spies in Numbers 13 and 14. Hebrews 3 and verse 16, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief, because of lack of faith. That was their problem. It was because they did not accept God's word. You see how vitally important it is, brothers and sisters, that when God says something, we believe it. We've mentioned it before, haven't we? It's not just believing in God. It's believing God when he speaks. So important that we take him on trust. He is worthy of, of every ounce of trust and, and confidence that we can place in him. And we despise his word when we do not trust it. So here, very important that we understand what is being said to us. And the argument continues straight on into chapter 4 and verse 1. Where the King James Version says, Let us, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Be warned by Israel's example. Make sure that God, the rest that God has promised us, we don't lose it like Israel did. Make sure that we hang on to that and obtain that rest. Sometimes you, you, sometimes you will hear people say that there are lots of times in Hebrews when this expression, let us, uh, recurs. Uh, and if you hear people talk about the lettuces in Hebrews, well, that's what they mean. They're not talking about the salad. They're talking about the let us as, 
right? That the, the number of times that expression let us recurs, the lettuces in, in Hebrews. Um, it's, it's a nice idea and it, it's, it's an interesting exercise to trace them all, all the way through the letter. But in fact, those words are not there in the Greek. So it, it's not really an exhortation that I'm, I'm going to follow up uh, this week. But if you want to do some homework on that, you're welcome to do that. What is important here is that this promise has been left to us. Notice that the the words that are used there, a promise being left us. In other words, for us, brothers and sisters, it is still today, isn't it? The promise is being left us. It's not too late for us to lay hold of that promise if we haven't yet done so by being baptised into the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 2, he says that this is part of the gospel. It it was the gospel that was preached to that generation of Israel. The gospel is not a New Testament thing. The gospel was preached to Abraham, as we know from Galatians 3. And so it was preached also to Israel, who came out of Egypt. Verse 2, unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. In them that heard it. You see, it was their unbelief again. That's what he said at the end of chapter 3. They couldn't enter the land, the promised rest, because of their unbelief. It was that the gospel wasn't mixed with faith. The gospel on its own is no use, is it? Unless we display a faith in it. Unless we believe it. Pick it up and, and, and make it important in our lives. That's what the apostle here is urging us to do. And in verse 3, when he says, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. When he says, if they shall enter into my rest, that phrase actually means, they shall not enter in. That's a little bit confusing, isn't it? It's an expression, if they shall enter into. Um, I suppose we would say, well, you just see if they enter into my rest. You see, it means they won't enter. That's really what it means. It's not a conditional statement. It doesn't mean, well, they might and they might not, if they enter in, or if they don't. It's, you see if they enter into my rest. God has said, you see if they enter. They, They won't. This generation will not enter into my rest. I shall not let them. That's what God is saying. So when you read that expression, if they shall enter into my rest, it really means they shall not enter. That's what God is saying. But this verse is a little bit uh, complex, isn't it? We need to just tease out what, what it's saying, I think. Let's just have another look at it. We which have believed, so the writer here is giving us the benefit of the doubt, we are men and women of faith. We have believed. And they which have, we which have believed do enter into rest. So there is a rest for us into which we can enter now, the Apostle is saying. We do enter it now, is what he's saying. So he's not talking about the kingdom at this point. He's saying that there is a rest which we do enter. We who have believed do enter into rest as he said. As I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? Well, when God first created the world, he created it in six days. And at the end of six days, God had finished all his work. That's what Genesis 2 tells us, right at the start of Genesis 2. God had completed his work. He saw all his work, that it was all very good, and he'd finished his work, which he'd decided to make. And before him was the seventh day of rest. The rest had now been prepared. Just as an aside, we don't know how long it was before Adam and Eve sinned. Personally, I believe they sinned on that very day, the seventh day. I believe that they sinned on that Sabbath. I believe that God never got his rest. And I believe that because 
when you really stop and, and think hard about what Jesus says in the Gospels, I think that's what Jesus means. When, they, when the religious leaders criticized Jesus for working on the Sabbath, he wasn't breaking the Jesus never broke the Sabbath. He fulfilled it. It's quite wrong to say that Jesus broke the Sabbath. He did miracles on the Sabbath that glorified God. And in so doing, he was showing the leaders of his day the real meaning of the Sabbath. He was fulfilling the Sabbath. And when they criticized him for it, he said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And when you really stop to think about that, Jesus is saying, God has never had his Sabbath rest. God reached the seventh day and would have rested, and Adam and Eve sinned, and God had to go straight back to work with the plan of salvation. And my father has worked hitherto. My father has always been working right up to now. And he's still working to accomplish the salvation of men and women. That's what Jesus seems to me to be saying. Now that's a a personal view. You don't have to accept that. Uh, uh, That's fine if, if, if you have other ideas. But it seems to me that that's what Jesus is saying. That that Adam and Eve may have sinned on that very first Sabbath. And uh, that God never had his rest. That rest is still to come. So that's what he's saying here in in verse 3. We who have believed there is a rest into which we enter now, but there is a rest to come, because God did all his work, and the rest was ready. I have, they shall not enter into my rest, Israel were not ready to enter into it, although the works were finished, the works of creation were finished on the sixth day from the foundation of the world. For, because he spake in a certain place of the seventh day, on this wise, in this way, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. That's what Genesis 2 says. And God did rest, and then immediately he had to go back to work again. So, there's the the Sabbath of Genesis 2, of which we're talking He spake in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. So that just confirms what verse 3 is about. It's about the works of creation made and completed in six days. And that seventh day that should have been a day of rest when God rested. The word means he ceased from his works. doesn't mean he he took a nap or, or put his feet up. It means simply that he ceased from his work. And then he had to go straight back to work again. And, verse 5, in this place again, they shall not enter into my rest. If they shall enter into my rest. The meaning, as we've said, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, the apostle here is developing an argument that we need to try and follow. And uh, what he's saying is, Israel did not enter into the rest that God had planned for them in the promised land because of their unbelief, as we have seen. But he's saying there is a rest into which we can enter now in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a rest which, when we are baptized, we appreciate, because we enter into rest in Christ. He is our rest. He is our Sabbath, isn't he? Come unto me, all ye that that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, For I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So the rest into which we enter is the rest that is Christ. We enter into Christ at baptism, and we have rest from our sins. Our sins are taken away. And that's the rest that we enjoy now. So there is a a rest into which we enter now in that sense. The rest from sin, when we become members of Christ. Now... There is also another rest here that he's talking about. He says, as we've seen, that the works were finished from the foundation of the world, so the rest was prepared and ready. And he goes on to talk about the fact that God ceased from his work on the seventh day, and that there, therein is a promise of sharing that rest with his creation. That's what God intended. And Israel, as we've seen, Israel in the wilderness, missed out on the rest that they should have enjoyed with God in God's land. And that's what Psalm 95 was saying. 
So, there is still a rest to share with God. That's the argument here. God prepared a rest in Genesis chapter 2. Israel never got that rest because they never reached the promised land when they should have done. So, the rest is still there. The rest is still there for someone to be enjoyed. That's the apostle's argument. Someone, he says, must enter into that rest. And the way that they can, the only way that they can do that is on the basis of faith. So that's his argument, sorry, that's his argument here. Verse 6, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, someone must share this rest with God that he's prepared for his people. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of their unbelief. Israel in the wilderness. Again, verse 7, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For, verse 8, if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Again, let's just tease out what, what the argument is here. What we're being told at this point is that Israel didn't enter into the rest under Jesus. And the Jesus here is not our Lord Jesus Christ, it is Joshua. It's the Old Testament Joshua. You will know, I'm sure, that the two names are the same. Joshua in the Hebrew translates as Jesus in the Greek. So the names are the same. There are two people. There is an Old Testament Joshua, and there's a New Testament Joshua in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when he says Jesus here, that's just because it's, it's the Greek from which the New Testament was translated. So the Jesus in this verse is Joshua, who would have taken Israel into the promised land, who would have given them rest. So, verse 8 again, For if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. So, there's still an opportunity of rest. It's still today, he says. There's still an opportunity of rest for us. Now, there is a way in which, of course, when Israel entered into the land... Joshua did give Israel rest. They subdued the land, didn't they? They took it all, they removed the nations who were there, or most of them. Joshua did his part at least, and then, as you know, after Joshua's death, the tribes of Israel failed to capitalize on what Joshua had done, and they let the, the, the native peoples of the land back into their cities. So they didn't obtain it. But If you're reading Joshua, you'll come across these words. Don't turn it up just now, but this is Joshua 21 and verse 43, and it sounds a bit confusing to begin with. It says this, And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it, and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about, according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. So that, those verses, Joshua 21, verses 43 to 45, say specifically the Lord gave them rest round about. And so that's a little bit puzzling, isn't it? There are two things to bear in mind. One is that in Joshua, there is a big difference between what the Lord gave Israel and what they took possession of. When you're reading Joshua, look out for the the recurring phrase, take possession of it. God gave it them, Israel failed largely to take possession of it. So that's one thing to bear in mind whenever you're reading through the book of Joshua. The other thing is that although the Lord gave them rest in a a physical sense, God drove out the nations, Joshua established Israel there, he did a good job. 
They had rest, in a sense. They never attained to what God intended them to have. They never attained the real rest of being his kingdom. They never fully attained what God had promised. They never really realized the promises of God to them or obtained the rest in the sense that God wanted them to. And that's significant because when Jesus comes, if you note the Gospels very carefully, Jesus, remember Jesus is the same name as Joshua, Jesus is the New Testament Joshua, you can, you can just discern, if you read the, rec- the Gospel records very carefully, that when Jesus came to be baptized and to begin his ministry, he came from the eastern side. He came from outside the land to the Jordan. That's where John was baptizing. Jesus came like Joshua to lead his people in. He was the one to give them the real rest, the spiritual rest, the rest that we've talked about that we have in Christ Jesus, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus came from outside the land. He was baptized and he crossed the Jordan into the land to begin his work. Symbolically, he was leading Israel in in a way that the Old Testament Joshua had never done. Not fully, not spiritually. Joshua might have given them a rest, driving out the nations for them. Physically, yes. But they never obtained the spiritual rest of becoming God's kingdom, which they should have done. And I think that's symbolized by the Lord Jesus Christ and and his baptism as he comes to Jordan and crosses it, symbolically the one to bring Israel in, the new Joshua. But the the argument of the writer here in, in Hebrews is that Joshua can't have given them the real rest Because whatever it says in the book of Joshua, after the time of Joshua, David in Psalm 95 was saying, there's a rest for the people of God. And God said, they won't enter into it, Israel won't enter into it, so the rest is still there. The fact that David spoke about it chronologically many, many years after Joshua proves that the rest is still to come. The rest is still available. The rest of the kingdom, the rest of the land, the promised land, the fulfillment of God's promises remains in the future. And that's proved by the fact that whatever happened in Joshua's day, David, under inspiration from God, was later still talking about coming into this kingdom rest. Now, I hope I haven't confused you with that. I hope I've, I've made that um, clear. I've done my best to explain the different kinds of, of rest that there are here. This argument is from chronology, that David coming later than Joshua, uh, the rest that David speaks of, is still to come. And so in verse 9, to make that quite clear, the apostle here changes the word he's been using. And he says in verse 9 of Hebrews 4, There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people of God. Because of what he said, because Joshua didn't give Israel the true rest, because David in the Psalms was still talking about the true rest, there remaineth, therefore, and this time he says, a Sabbath rest. The Sabbath rest that God always wanted to share with his people, it was there ready and waiting from Genesis 2. Israel failed to get it. It's still there. It's the Sabbath rest of the kingdom. The Sabbath rest of the fulfillment of the promises of God to Abraham. It's still there, verse 9. There remaineth, therefore, a Sabbath rest to the people of God. Verse 10, notice what verse 10 is saying. For he that is entered into his rest, see, that's past tense again, isn't it? Those who have already entered, He who has entered into his rest, like us, in Christ, by the grace of God, we who've entered into the rest uh, by being baptized into Christ and receiving the forgiveness of our sins, he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, that is, the works of sin, his own works, working for himself. We're no longer living for ourselves now. We used to do that in the past, before we were baptized, we lived to ourselves. Now, Romans 6 says, after baptism, we live unto God. We live unto Christ. 
We're no longer doing our own works. We've taken a rest from them. We've come into Jesus Christ. So, he who is entered into his rest hath ceased from his own works, as God did in the beginning, just as God finished his works uh, and prepared the rest for everyone. So now, we are entered into the rest in Christ. Verse 12, for the word of God is quick or living, that word really means. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. So there, there is a paradox, isn't there? Verse 11 says, we must work hard to enter into this rest. Now that's a a conundrum, isn't it? You have to work hard to enter into the rest. Labour in order to rest. The word really means give diligence. We're to be diligent to make sure that we don't lose out on this rest. And that we don't fall after the same example of unbelief. Let us labour therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example. The word there is an exhibit. That's what Israel are, isn't it? That's what the nation of Israel were. They were an exhibit. The history of Israel is set out like an exhibition for us to look at and learn from it. And we mustn't follow their example of unbelief. We must be men and women of faith. Men and women who accept God's word and are able to enter into that rest. So just to sum up that little section, we've, we've covered there four different kinds of of rest. There is the seventh day when God ceased from his works at creation and began to rest. A rest that he wanted to share with his people but a rest that was destroyed by Adam's disobedience. That's the first rest. The seventh day rest. Then there was the second which was the the rest that Israel should have had in the kingdom that they missed out on. Because of their unbelief, they failed to enter into the rest that was the kingdom of God. Under Joshua, they never really entered in. They were, they were faithless in the wilderness. They were refused it then. They had to wander for 40 years. And even under Joshua, they didn't truly enter and become the kingdom of God in a spiritual sense. So there's that second rest that Israel missed out on. Thirdly, there is that rest from sin in Jesus Christ. The rest that Jesus offers us when he says, Come unto me, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So there is that rest that we have by being baptized into Jesus Christ when our sins are taken away. And fourthly, there is the kingdom. There is that Sabbath rest of the millennium which is still to come. There is that future rest, which the New Testament Joshua, our Lord Jesus Christ, will bring with him when he comes, and which, by the grace of God, if we are in Christ, we shall then share. And all those four kinds of rest are in the mind of the Apostle as he writes these words and encourages the Jewish Christians not to fail like Israel did, and encourages us in exactly the same way. Well, lastly, let's just look at this, this final little section here from uh, verses 12 to 16 where he shows that the word is, as we said, living and powerful because it's the word of Christ. And he says, it divides asunder between soul and spirit or perhaps better, between what is soulish and what is spiritual. James speaks about the wisdom which is from beneath, which he says is, is sensual and devilish. It's soulish is the actual word. It means it belongs to the physical, it belongs to the senses, it belongs to this world. It's, it's everything about us that is sensual, to do with the senses. It's soulish. That's that part of us. And there is a spiritual part to us, if we will allow it to grow and, and to develop. And the word of God can divide between those. It can see that sometimes the flesh is willing, but the spirit is weak. It can divide 
this word of God. It's living and powerful to see what we really want to do, what's in our hearts, to see the spiritual from the sensual, from the soulish, from the things that we sometimes do. And the word of God is powerful to make that distinction and to know what is really in our hearts, whether our hearts are soulish or spiritual. The hymn in verse 13 is like the priest peeling back the flesh from the burnt offering. It's the burnt offering that's being referred to here. The burnt offering was the only sacrifice which had to be opened up and it had to be without blemish inside as well as outside. All the other sacrifices had to be without blemish on the outside, but inside it wasn't too important. Nobody ever knew. But the burnt offering, all the organs inside had to be perfect, faultless, intact. And the, the priest would peel back the flesh and examine them. And that's what's happening here. That's what the word of God does with us. Jesus Christ and our Lord God can see right into our hearts. It's as though they can peel back our lives and see what's really in there, whether we are spotless internally or whether our hearts are not right. And so it says that Jesus is is our priest in that way. And he's gone through the heavens, look, verse 14, through the heavens into the very presence of God himself. It probably doesn't mean heaven as we would think of it, it means really the, the tabernacle. The, the word really is the heavenlies. Jesus has gone through the mosaic system. He's gone right through the tabernacle. He, he's gone, gone through the east, east gate. He's gone through the court, through the holy place, right into the most holy place. He's gone through the heavenlies. That's really what the word means. That's why it's plural, the heavens, rather than into heaven. It's saying that Jesus has gone right through the Mosaic system. He's fulfilled it perfectly as our high priest and has gone into the presence of God in the most holy place. And notice this time he says Jesus, the Son of God. That's to distinguish him from the Jesus who was Joshua in those earlier verses. Just so there's no doubt this time he describes Jesus as the Son of God there in verse 14. And then he says, verse 15, If there is a question about Christ's whereabouts, remember these Jewish Christians were perplexed, weren't they? Where was Jesus now? If he was Messiah, why wasn't he establishing the kingdom? Well, this is where he is. He's a priest and a merciful one at that. And he's gone into the presence of Almighty God to make representations for us in that throne that's mentioned in verse 16, the mercy seat. That's where Jesus is. He's there to make intercession for us. And God willing, that's where we'll pick it up tomorrow morning.